Well, good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Doing well? A little bit of energy in the room, huh? We got probably have some people out sick. I know Weston has a cold, so Courtney and Weston are home. I had the joy of rocking him to about 1245 last night. Uh, so that's always fun. Tis the season, right? It's Christmas season, and, and, and we're in this series called Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Once again, I think uh, a lot of people appreciate Jesus as a religious figure, but that's not who Jesus was. That's a total just cop-out from who Jesus really is. Uh, numbers predict that there's been over a million people, uh, actually much more, I think 70 million people martyred for the Christian faith since Jesus roamed the earth. So how could someone die for just a good thought? Who was Jesus? He was a real man. And why do we celebrate him in his birth like no one ever before us? And we're going to look at that uh, through the new year, really. And, and, and we're going to uh, talk about it. Last week was Jesus as the outcast. This week is Jesus as the sufferer. Some of you may be thinking, Ryan, it's Christmas. Come on now, lighten up a little bit. Right, it's a little more happier. We'll get there. But here's the reality. If Jesus is not an outcast or a sufferer, we don't have joy. We don't have reason to celebrate him. So we're going to look at that this morning. Jesus as a sufferer. Uh, back in 2010, actually, uh, there's a seminary in India, and it was attacked. Uh, there were seven students making dinner together, and people came in. They beat them with rods. Uh, they beat them with anything they have, fluorescent light tubes. Anything that's beating these young men. When the students asked what the attackers were doing, why they were doing this, they didn't get an answer. This kept getting beaten. <laughs> Over and over. They weren't killed. They were just injured very badly. Uh, but, you know, we, that's mild compared to some. Uh, last Saturday in Burkina Faso, I have a good friend from Burkina Faso, and uh, 14 Christians were killed, including a 12-year-old in church. So the question is, all this suffering, I think for us, what does it mean? There has to have meaning in it. And I think there is, when we talk about the Christian life, suffering is it's a byproduct of the Christian faith. Just know that first and foremost. A lot of churches want to shy away. A lot of people don't want to give you the blunt. Suffering is part of the Christian faith. C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite writers, said this, The real problem is not why some pious, humble, believing people suffer, but why some do not. It's interesting when people don't suffer for the Christian faith. It's interesting that people try to avoid suffering when it's kind of at the core of who we are. Now, granted, we're going to talk about suffering a little bit and why it's different what Jesus did, but suffering is kind of inherent with the Christian faith. And so we're going to be in Isaiah 53. This is a um, very, if you had the app, I put, I put the actual whole chapter in, in the notes so you can just open that up. Uh, this is a very popular prophecy uh, made about Christ. And so Isaiah 53, Isaiah is a prophet, and, and, and really what we find here is, is he's not writing about his own time. He's living in the 8th century before Christ, so he's writing about the 6th century, about this Babylonian exile in this chapter. He's talking about Judah is going to go away. But have faith, God will restore it. And even in this message of restoration, he's pointing to a greater restoration for the whole world in this chapter. So he's writing about this, Jews going to go, Israel's going to suffer, they're going to go away, but don't worry, God's going to redeem His people. But overall, the whole world is going to be redemption through one. And we get to Isaiah 53. So let's read the first three together. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before Him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. So we get this picture of a, of a shoot, right? A shoot at the dry ground or a root. So it, I have a picture here of a western cedar. 
right? So when you think about impressive, we're impressed with a, with a couple things. Number one, we're impressed with uh, skyscrapers, right? If you want the best apartment in a skyscraper, where, where is it? It's at the top. If you want a, a Christmas tree to be impressive, what do you get? Do you get a, 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 two, a Charlie Brown one? Two-footer? No. You get the big one that's going to go all the way to the ceiling. And if we could go to the next slide, uh, this is a western cedar. That's a grown man sitting next to it. They're huge. They're gigantic. If you read, actually, in the building of the temple, they, you, you read about the cedars of Lebanon. So you have... You have Israel, you have Lebanon right over here. The cedars of Lebanon, it's dry now. It's interesting. It used to be like a swamp back in the day. That's why many people didn't travel through there. Armies didn't. They took the King's Highway, uh, which is to the right of it, because if you get caught in a swamp, you're kind of dead. Uh, but they had huge cedar trees, and they used it to build the temple. Why? Because those are sturdy. You can cut that thing up, and you can make a house just with that one tree. It won't fall down. You know what you do with a, with a shoot? You cut it off. Anyone get those? I, I call, we call them suckers. The bottom of your tree, they, they grow out, and you're like, oh, this looks annoying. Just cut them out. It looks dirty. You know, you cut off that piece. Well, here Isaiah is saying there's going to be a shoot. It comes out of dry ground. Interesting dry ground, right? Almost, what can, what can come out of dry ground? What can live? Nothing but this tender shoot comes out of the ground. Normally we cut it off. When we read here, he had, just like a sucker or a shoot, he had no majesty to attract us to him. He had no beauty. Nothing that we should desire his appearance. You know, we get this idea of, once again, a tender shoot is something that's not impressive. That, that's impressive. Can you imagine having like one of those in your backyard? People come all over to look at it. But not a little shoot. You cut that off. He had no, no, no desirable attraction to the eye. And I think that's an interesting thing. We look at Jesus and we think about what they're looking for. Once again, why did Israel, why did the Pharisees completely miss on Jesus? They were looking for a king. A king is not a carpenter, okay? A king is not someone who has a mid-level job. A king is someone who's born into royalty. They, 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 they have a sword like David, and they conquer land. But you're saying this Jesus dude is king? He makes tables for a living. No way. He can't be king. There's nothing attractive about him. We read on. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We, like sheep, have all gone astray. Each of us turned our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Once again, we talked about this, this passage last week, this specific verse. We see this. He bore our suffering. Okay, understand that. Like the suffering that Jesus took on was a suffering that you deserve. This is why his suffering is different. He took on an eternal punishment, an eternal suffering that we never will have to. His is different. Your iniquities, your screw-ups, your mistakes, your sin, just paid for it. And, and this is a great thing about this. We don't have to be like, we don't act like, oh, he didn't pay for mine because I don't have any. No, praise God, all of us, all of you are like sheep. Once again, anyone here ever worked with sheep before? Dumbest animal ever. Isaiah is saying we are all the dumbest animal ever. Welcome to Ross Christian Church. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, right? But the, we, why? Because we all have left God. That's why. We all have left God and shows our own way. Last week, you left God. Yesterday, actually, maybe even this morning, right? If you have a family getting ready for you probably sinned, right? Like you probably had a bad thought. We probably, let's just go with yesterday. You all have sinned and have gone astray. We're all in need of this. Every one of us has gone astray. But the punishment 
that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. This is an interesting thing. Uh, the idea last week of a scapegoat, of putting the sin on the goat, sending it out into the wilderness, kicking it, right? Go out there to die. The sin of Israel is on that goat. In the same way, when you are a child of God, you're, you're pretty much saying, putting your hand on Jesus' head on the cross and said, my sin's on you. You die. And Jesus is saying, yes, I'll take that for you. It's not just us. It's not us condemning him. It's just saying, yes, I want that for you. It's an amazing picture. It's an amazing thing. That's why this baby, the simple picture of a baby in a manger, that's why we celebrate it. It's not because like, oh, a baby. We all love babies, right? Maybe. Right? I love my babies. That's about it. Because I'm not a baby person, right? I want them to sleep through the night. But we all love this idea. But it's not the, if we just love the idea of a Christmas story, we're missing actually the entire meaning of Christmas. This baby was pierced for your transgressions. This baby was crushed for your iniquities. The punishment you deserve was on this baby. By his wounds we are healed. The rest of the passage says this. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its ears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence. Nor was any deceit in his mouth. And we get this idea once again. Like a lamb led to slaughter. Anyone here play the game or heard of the game Mafia? Okay, yeah, uh, yeah. So a lot. Of, I love the game Mafia. You play it with family. Uh, don't play it when you're like angry, because then it's going to come out in this game. All right, it's going to end badly for people. If you ever played before, you'll understand what I'm saying. Uh, here's how it works. You have a group of people, let's say 15. 15 is a great number to play this with. Uh, two people are mafia. The rest of them, there's like an angel police officer. I forget what the names are. But you just try to guess who is mafia. Pretty much you get to start instigating people. Like the first night everyone wakes up, and it's like, okay, let's pick someone to, 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 to kill that night, right? To, to, to go away from the game. You just get randomly pick someone. You know who's the loudest people always? The innocent people, right? Like, like especially if you're not good at the game, like, if you're not good at the game in your mafia, you're usually just like, mm -hmm. like, what do I do? What do I say? People are going to know I'm lying. You know? But the, if, if, if you accuse an innocent person, they go, I'm not mafia. I'm not mafia. Eventually, you may get to that with the mafia people. Usually, they try to distract you with something else. But innocent people are like, I'm not mafia. I'm not guilty. I'm not guilty. Jesus, more than anyone through the history of mankind, could have stood there and yelled, I'm not guilty. And he would have been absolutely right. But he didn't do that. Like a lamb before its shears is silent, so was he. Why didn't he scream? Why didn't he scream from the rooftops that I am innocent? Because he came for this reason. He didn't scream and he said, yes, I'm innocent, but yes, I'm going to take this for mankind. I'm going to take this on me for everyone. That's why he was silent. It wasn't because he didn't know what to say. It wasn't because he was so mad. It's because he wanted to take this on for you. He came for this reason, to die for you. The innocent became sin for you. That's why he's silent. It's not because he's tongue-tied. He's silent because he loves you. He was silent to his death because he wanted to die for you. What's the last words you read before his death? It is finished. He's not talking about his life. That's referred to. He's talking about the penalty, the price. It is finished. It's paid for. The debt has been cleared. There's a pathway back to God now. You're no longer you're separate from God. You are now. That's why the curtain, the, the, the curtain, the curtain tore for the Holy of Holies because guess what? There's no, no division between us and God because of Jesus. 
That's why. That's why he was silent, because he, he, he knew what he was doing. Yet, it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many. and He will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great. And he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. God's plan was this from the beginning of time, that you would do this, that, that, that you would have to come to a point in your life where you said, I cannot make up the gap between me and God. I can't pay the price for my own sin. I need a Savior. Sage left, Jesus comes. He says, that's exactly why I died. God says, that is exactly my plan for the beginning of time, for me to die, for you, to suffer for you the death that you deserved. Isn't it amazing? It's, it's, it's amazing because you think about this, everything about the story of Jesus, you know, think about it even as, we, we, like, to, we like to hallmark the Bible. Do you know what I mean when I say like to hallmark the Bible? Like, you ever watched a Hallmark Christmas movie? I've watched about five minutes of one. We'll never watch it again. But if you watch it, we, we hallmark the Bible. Like, the, the story of Christmas, like the teenage virgin, hey, I'm pregnant. Ah, tell your family that. See how that goes. Like, it's by the Holy Spirit, Mom and Dad. Not going to go well, right? We like to, we like to beautif- beautify this thing, but guess what? This story is a difficult story of suffering from the very beginning. Suffering in a way that you wouldn't have to. So when we talk about this, see, even, even before, I mean, I couldn't hold my tongue if I was him, like, I'm innocent, but I'm dying for you fools who are about to kill me, right? At, at the very least, I'd say that, like, you all are stupid, like, like I'm final statement, y'all are idiots, and you're welcome, okay, go ahead, right? But he didn't even do that, because he died for them too, he died for all mankind, and, and the amazing thing, he didn't say a word, man, my kids, if I accuse them of doing something wrong, they start crying, Right? Jesus is silent. Why? Because he loves you. Because the fact that he became sin and we didn't deserve it, it didn't matter to him because he loved you. So what do we take away from this? Number one, Jesus faced a suffering and rejection so we would never have to. So we'd never have to. Once again, I'm not talking about suffering at all. Yes, we have suffering. Yes, we face suffering in this life, but we've never faced the suffering of being rejected by God, of becoming sin, of being crushed under the weight of penalty. We will never have to do that. The Father will never turn his face away from you because he did it to Jesus. So he would never, ever, ever turn from you. Praise God for that. Because through him, we're not just, God doesn't just tolerate us. We become his children. He loves us. It's amazing. It, it, and you think about this, so, so Ryan, what do we do with suffering in this life? Because we all will go through it. And you all go through it at some point, going through it now. We do a suffering we have to look to the Savior. The second part of that story of, of, of the seminary in India, the students, is what the article read. This is one of the students. Through this situation, I learned what the Bible means when it says, blessed are those who suffer for Christ. This opposition was the test of my faith to march forward and to share the gospel. They hit my stomach with an iron rod and I was injured, but I am grateful to the Lord Jesus who kept me safe to be a witness for him. Another student recalls the moment the attack began. For a moment I was shocked about why this was happening to me. Then I understood that the time had come for me to glorify his name. It was my privilege to suffer for Christ, and I am happy today because I can testify that God protected me and brought me safe from death to proclaim his word and stand as a living testimony for Christ with a strong faith. Do you understand your suffering? 
is a testimony of praising God. They can join Jesus in, suffer, in suffering, but praise God, you'll never have to endure the suffering Jesus did. The rejection, the punishment, the crush, <laughs> being crushed under sin. You'll never have to do that because of Jesus. And we can join in his suffering when we do suffer. Because here's reality too, you're going to suffer in this life and maybe it's the world rejecting you. That's part of it. Like, do you understand why, this is why I believe Christians struggle nowadays more than my generation, more than, more than ever before. Because if you were a Christian back in 1960, 1970, it's par for the course in society, right? You go to church, everyone does. Now, Christianity is not seen so favorably. So you're going to be, you have to choose Christ and be rejected by man. Sometimes the church will even reject you. You have to be okay with that and, be, and say, you know what? For Jesus' sake, I'm going to glorify his name. And if I suffer, I suffer for his name. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. We have to make that choice, and we can because we'll never face rejection Jesus did. You know, here is the reality about Jesus, what he did on the cross. Each one of you, each one of us is going to stand. And, and, and just picture this. There's two tables. One, your life. This table, Jesus, his death, his resurrection, his life. There's God standing there. And God says, okay, let's use me for example. Okay, Ryan, here we are. What do you choose? For, for you, what do you choose to make up the gap that, you, that your failures and your shortcomings, every time you fell short, you have to make up that gap. Do you want... Your works, your life, or do you want Jesus? And if you want Jesus, it's free. It is yours. I've, I've uh, you know, I put in a nice basket. You can take it. It is yours. You know what the sad thing is? Anyone, anyone who, who stands there and says, hey, I want my own life, is rejecting the only thing you need. That we have this offering of a free gift. It's Jesus. And it's to reject Jesus. We're staying there. And we see the suffering. We see what he went through. We see what he did for us. And that's for us to say, no, I don't want that. That's got to be hurtful. Right? Think about that. It, it, what Jesus did for you, he comes up to you. He's bleeding like, here's my life. No, I don't want that. Man, today, I don't know where you are in your faith. I don't know. I, don't, I, I have no idea, but if you have never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, if you've never been baptized into Him, if you've never made a decision to go all in for Jesus, you need to make it today. It's ridiculous, and honestly, it's really foolish to not. It's the only way to make up the gap for your shortcomings. It's only through Jesus. And he faces suffering and rejection that we deserved, so we would never have to. Number two, Jesus' suffering means you are loved. It means you are loved. He became sin, Jesus, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus' suffering means you are loved. It means he died for you. It means you will never have to face that rejection from, from God, that suffering. You'll never have to do that. You are loved by God. Do you understand that? The, the, the whole Christmas story shows how much God loves you. Despite the suffering you're going to face in this world, we don't look around us. We don't look around and say, oh, what hope do we have? We look forward knowing that Jesus died for me. Knowing that I have hope beyond hope in Him. Knowing that someday He's going to make it all right. Knowing that He died for my sins. You know, I, this is why I love Christmas. Especially when you think about Christmas morning. Think about Christmas morning. It doesn't matter what you're going through. Maybe it's just an hour, but with your kids, with your family, you get some momentary just pure joy. Right? With my kids, it's usually two minutes. <laughs> and then they start fighting. It's like, okay, that was a good two minutes. I'm going to hold on to that for the next year. Um, but that two minutes, that's going to be eternity for me. 
That's going to be eternity for God's children, that pure joy. We don't have a worry, care in the world. Someday that's going to be forever for those who are in Christ. That's what we look forward to. That's what we... It's because of His suffering that makes it possible. Do you understand that? It's because of His suffering we'll experience pure joy. And, and, and I really, really want us to hold on to this. If you're suffering, compared to eternity, it's a blink of an eye. It's a blink of an eye. It's hard, it's terrible, it's difficult, but we can have joy even in the suffering because of what Christ has done for us. His suffering means you're loved. You're not rejected. You're loved. Number three. Because we are loved, we can treat the whole world with love. Because we are loved, we can treat the whole world with love. I do love Christmas season. Um, the whole season, I love Christmas. And, and say what you want, you know, and I don't know. It doesn't matter where you fall in certain things, certain celebrations. I just love that, like, especially in America, everyone doesn't realize that they're celebrating the birth of Jesus. Some people are like, I'm atheist, I don't care, blah. But you, I'm like, oh, you're celebrating Christmas. I love Jesus too, right? It's like an opportunity to be like, look, this is about Jesus. And I love it because everyone celebrates it. It's a time, it's a season where, you know, people are nice to each other, hopefully, sometimes, outside of Black Friday, where they beat each other for a toy. You know, we're usually nice to each other. We have the opportunity to invite the world to celebrate Jesus with us as the church. I love it. I love it. And when we invite people here, when th- this, is, this is where the church goes wrong. Because we think pointing out faults in others will help them know Jesus. We think that if we help them know where they're wrong and point with this and say, this is, this is why you're dumb, all this stuff, we can show them the truth. We're just called to love as Jesus did. One of my favorite preachers right now, his name is John Weiss. John Weiss is down in Lexington, Kentucky at Southland Christian Church. And this man, his whole life, it's, it's a cool testimony to how good God is and how much we're called to love. I want to read you a little bit about his life that he shared uh, with a publication one time. I grew up with parents who loved Jesus with all their heart and didn't make it complicated. They had a really simple love, but a deep love for Jesus and for people. Our house growing up was a hotel for people my dad would meet during the day. He prayed a simple prayer every morning that God would put at least three people in his path that he could love or share his faith with. He kept a journal of those names. When my siblings and I would come home from school, we never knew who was going to be at the dining room table or who might be sleeping in the spare bedroom. I remember getting off the school bus and him saying, hey, we're going down to the creek to baptize someone. And my dad loved to pick, pick up hitchhikers. He'd say, once I got them in there, it's a captive audience. He'd drive 30 miles an hour and tell them what a difference Jesus made in his life. That was normal for us. I didn't know anything else. He worked at the University of Missouri for 40 plus years as a campus pastor. And church was exciting to me. Seeing thousands of college kids come to faith. My framework for faith and even for the church was established young. Probably my first real spiritual movement that I remembered was in 1977. My parents were watching a documentary on refugees from the Vietnam War. My parents got up from the couch and went to the kitchen to have a conversation. The details after that are a little bit fuzzy, but a year later, we went to the airport to pick up a family. My parents had signed on with the World Relief to be a host family. We were not wealthy by any stretch, the six of us living in a small house. We took in a family of eight. They moved in with us. We never formally adopted people. We have a huge family of refugee people that were a part of us. My parents constantly were reaching out. Compassion was birthed in my life through my parents' compassion. And I think for, like, like his, when you hear him talk, he's just different. You can tell it seriously is his DNA to love people. And it doesn't matter. There's, there's no asterisk there. There's no only if they do that. He just loves people, and it's the most beautiful thing I've seen in a long time. And thinking about Christmas and thinking about 
who we are in Christ, can we just be a people that does this? Like, the God of this universe came to this earth as a baby, lived a sinless life, but became all sin for all man to die on the cross so you wouldn't have to get the just punishment that you deserve. So you get grace and mercy instead. As a result, we're called to love. To love all people. If, if, if I could really describe what does it mean to be a Christian to love people with the love of Christ? Look, I don't care where you stand theologically. I don't care if you know uh, all the answers to all the questions. I don't care about all that. If you don't love with the love of Christ, you've missed Jesus. You've missed who he was. You missed what he died and came to do. So as a church, in, in going into 2020, I want to become a church that just loves people with reckless abandon that doesn't have any concern for anything else. Where I want to be a people, and, 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 and specifically, I want to be a family with my kids that just loves people, that embodies this, and almost what John was talking about. I want to be a family that just gives and gives, is motivated by love of Christ. Because when we're motivated by the love of Christ, that energizes us to keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going. It's, I, I love this time of year. We've got to remember who Jesus is. He was an outcast. He was the sufferer. He took on the suffering that we deserve. And that's more reason to praise God. That's more reason to celebrate this Christmas. And, and if I have one challenge, I challenge you to be changed by the love of Christ. Like, let it actually change who you are. Let it change how you think. Let it change how you operate. Let it change how you interact with people. Let it change... By interacting with people, maybe. Let it change by actually being a light in a dark world. Let it change by showing people what the love of Christ is without any qualification. So as we, as we close here, that, that, that's my challenge for us, to be a church that loves. If you've never, ever, ever made a decision for Jesus, if you've never made him Lord of your life, if you've never gone all in with him, if you've never been baptized, don't walk out today. Don't walk out today without doing that. I'm going to be up here. An elder will be up here too. Just come forward. But my challenge for you, love the world as Jesus has loved us. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you so loved the world that you gave your only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life, God. Thank you for that gift. God, personally, thank you for being my Savior. Thank you for dying for my sin. Thank you for loving me when I am literally unlovable. Thank you for never rejecting me. And God, I pray that I love people with your love. Don't reject people, God, but, I, but you soften my heart to all people, God, so I can love whoever comes across my house when I'm walking. God, I pray that for all of us, that your love actually changes us. It's not a good idea, but it changes our lives. We thank you. We love you. We ask this all in your name.